within 60 feet of my cabin out on Saddleback Lake. So especially the point, you don't have to wander far away to photograph wildlife. Sometimes your own front yard is the best place. But also finding out where their home is, is also a really effective way of doing it. Um, all, all three of these pictures were literally taken right within a five mile radius of my house. So you don't, again, you don't have to go real far, but finding out where their home is, is also a, a key way to get good wildlife photos. Um, so another way of finding subject is food sources. Um, is is a, a just a good spot to go sit and watch. Um, all three of these photos here, two of which were also taken, the two bird photos actually taken in a tree right outside my front window. And the the buck was taken by someone locally, he was taken in his yard where I know that he feeds deer in the wintertime. If you're going to put up food sources uh, as a way of attracting wildlife, there's a couple things you need to think about, um, particularly this applies probably more to birds than it does uh, to mammals like the buck. Um, you want to place your food sources near areas of shelter, um, provide a variety of food that will attract them because birds like to eat different things. Deer in the wintertime, yeah, it's store-bought deer food. Um, mind the light and the background. Um, you'll notice that both of these images Particularly the two bird images have rather blurred out fuzzy backgrounds, which makes the subjects much more noticeable. So if you are gonna use provided food sources, just be, be mindful of where you're putting them and where you're positioning yourself to photograph the wildlife. But also finding them with natural food sources is always a really good way to, to find wildlife. Um, these are three prime examples taken from spring right up through summer and actually into winter with this pine grosbeak break that's feeding on berries. This was actually taken right in downtown Rangeley on trees that are unfortunately no longer there. So finding natural food sources is always a really good way to locate wildlife. Whoops, hold on, how did I get to the last slide? That wasn't supposed to happen. Slides out of order here, excuse me. Water sources, this is something that Ben's probably gonna to touch on later in his talk, are also really good ways of finding the wildlife. They're always gonna to come to food and or water. So sitting and watching those two sources of nutrition are always really, really good ideas. Now, one other thing about wildlife is remember that by nature, almost all birds and mammals are creatures of habit. They're usually gonna take the same routes in and out of their territory, or they're gonna, um, they'll use the same routes to return to certain parts of their territory. As in the sample of this winter wren, the bird over on the left, he would routinely, every morning, some mornings more than others, he would return to this one spot to sit and sing. So identifying their movement patterns is, is really key to positioning yourself to get good wildlife photos. Um, the hermit thrush in the center is also a prime example. She would constantly return in and out through the same route to this branch, which was actually just above and slightly to the left of where she was building a nest. So once I learned that, all I had to do was just sit in one spot. This is actually one of the heritage trust properties um, and so I just learned to watch that one spot. She would constantly come in and out. She would perch on this branch carrying a beak full of nesting material and then drop down into her nest site. This fox was the same way. This was a fairly established route that he or she would follow through their territory in the wintertime. So it was just a matter of sitting there watching and knowing that eventually they're going to come along on this route. Let me get back to that one. Again, they're creatures of habit. So this gray jay, this stump was a, a, along a flight path that he would routinely 
move along as he was following food. Um, this fawn was actually found on a path up near Mingo Springs Golf Course that the deer pretty much used routinely, um, stumbled across this fawn as the mother went across the road with the triplets. I walked back into the woods and the fawn was just laying there on the ground. Um, the pileated woodpecker, again, you know that they're always gonna return to a nesting cavity, particularly when they have young to feed. So setting up in a spot like that and just watching and waiting, eventually an image like this is, is gonna come along if you identify those spots and just sit long enough. Um, sitting and observing, I think, is really key to a lot of this. I'm sorry that the thrush slide got put in there twice, um, but all these images were basically created just by sitting in one spot and watching for any of these particular behaviors, again, nesting. In this case, this white-throated sparrow would sit in this spot and constantly sing um, territorial songs in response to birds on other territories. Um, just by sitting and observing, you can capture social interactions like these two young loons that were actually just taken yesterday out on Hunter Cove. Um, these are a list of the other behaviors that you're likely to come across or see when just sitting basically in one spot. Um, selecting locations locally around here, it gets really kind of challenging because we're so heavily forested, but logging cuts and or forest clearings work really well. Um, forest clearing is uh, the spruce grouse down here is a real prime example of one. I knew the bird was in that area, just went and sat in this clearing and eventually it did show up. Uh, logging cuts, forest clearings, logging roads, hiking trail systems, the RLHT's trail systems are a great place to go out and photograph. The Blackburnian Warbler was actually taken over in, this was in Hatchery Brook, um, not too far off, right along the trail system actually. Um, open fields around here when you can find them are great spots to photograph. <clears throat> particularly because they provide clear sight lines. So you can usually see what's coming or you can see what's moving. Getting out on the water, which Ben's gonna talk a lot about later, is another great way to find wildlife or a great location around here. Um, being unobtrusive is kind of the key. Um, wearing dark clothing or camouflage is usually always a good idea. Um, even if you're photographing birds, uh, wearing white light clothing that makes you just that much more noticeable. Uh, create natural blinds that you can hide in, use what's on hand. I use fallen trees, uh, sections of tree trunks, branches, anything you can pile up that breaks up your shape. Um, using portable blinds is a really great idea. I actually have one of these, well I had one, I just wore it out. It actually fell apart. Um, but these are two sources for um, blinds. The Ameristat blinds are really inexpensive. They're the ones I tend to use the most because if they get wet and they fall apart, it doesn't cost a lot to replace them. The Tragopan photography blinds are a bit pricier, but also very good. Um, finding a sit spot, this is something I'm a real big advocate of if you don't, don't want to lug a blind, portable blind around with you. Finding sit spots is a great idea. Just make sure that what's behind you is breaking up your shape, that you're not strongly backlit because your movement shows up against that. Um, using your vehicle as a blind, that's how I actually got the picture of these two deer right here, was using my vehicle as a blind. And I just stuck a jacket up over the window behind me and closed the window so that my movement wasn't noticeable against the window behind me. Creating a backyard habitat is just another great way to get started in this. Um, providing food and water sources, locating above sources near shelter, providing nesting material, creating natural perches, um, placing the perches just above food sources, um, installing water drips are all great ways to attract. And there's tons of information out there on the internet. If you look up about creating backyard um, habitats to photograph in, or if you have any questions about that, just contact me. Um, bird photography tips. Longer lenses tend to work best. Um, if you're gonna invest in lenses, it's probably better to spend your money on quality lenses 
versus top line cameras. Um, tripods are all almost a strong recommendation when using long lenses. Um, they help with ensure sharpness. Use at least a minimum match of, of F8 to ensure sharpness in detail. Make sure that the eyes are sharp. That should be what you want to focus on as much as possible if you can. When using long lenses, select your shutter speeds equal to the length of the lens. And the reason for that is that with long, long lens barrels, vibration sometimes tends to travel up and down the lens barrel as you're photographing. It can cause some distortion in the images. So as a general rule, use a shutter speed that's at least equal to or greater than the length of the lens. Watch for natural catch lights in the eyes. This is particularly important with birds that have dark heads and dark eyes like black capped chickadees. You get that little specular catch light, which is just a little small white dot that appears in the eye. It makes the eyes just stand out a little bit. Uh, early morning is generally considered the best time. Um, that's when the birds tend to be most active and the light is the best. Finding a sit spot and minimizing your movement is a really good idea. Um, you know, the more hand movement, the more head movement you make, the more likely they are to notice you. That's where camouflage comes in. There have been times I've even been known to mask my face so that the white of my face doesn't show. Uh, watch for interesting poses, the you know, leg positions, the wing stretch as with the top photo of the chipping sparrow. Watch for distracting backgrounds. Yes, sometimes it's unavoidable. There's elements of the backgrounds in both these photos that are distracting. But if it's a question of, do I take the shot? Do I not take the shot? I'll take the shot. And then sometimes the backgrounds, it is what it is. Um, positioning yourself so the light, you know, the, the general rule is positioning yourself so that the light's coming over your shoulder or you're pointing your shadow at the bird. I don't always buy that. Sometimes I like having light coming in from the side much as it was in the photo of the of the, the chipping sparrow rather than coming straight over my shoulder as it was in the photo of the boreal chickadee. It's a general rule but one that I always like to bend a bit at times. Um, mammal photo tips um, short lenses are better. Um, you don't really need really long glass to photograph them just because of their size. Look for what I call intimate portraits or where they're making eye contact with you as in the photo of that eight point buck. Where actually I was out looking for a spot to photograph moose standing in one spot and he wandered. He was literally laying down about 20 feet away from me. I didn't even know it until he wandered until he stood up and moved and wandered into view. Um, as with birds, you'll, you'll want to ensure that the eyes are well lit and sharp. Um, and a lot of these cases find with these mammals, a lot of them, if they have dark colors like the moose, that soft light with this moose taken during the rainstorm with light cloud cover or some degree of cloud cover really works to your advantage. Um, watch the distance between the subject and the background. Again, the further away you can pull them from the background, the further away they are, the better. Um, if not, try to minimize them so that they're not against a really bright area that distracts you from the image. Um, watch for indications of their, of their fight or flight distance. Uh, all mammals and all birds have a fight or flight distance. If you get inside it, they're going to do one of two things. They're either going to turn around and they're going to let you have it or they're going to run away. So just always be mindful of their behaviors. Okay. Thinking like a hunter may sound a little bit strange, but that's probably a, a really good key to foreground wildlife is to think like a hunter. Um, they, they follow a lot of the same things, finding a Sith spot, sitting there, minimize their movement, dressing in camouflage, and all it works. With the case of some mammals, particularly moose in the fall is a good example, make sure to leave yourself a safe way out in case they decide they really don't want you there. Um, and they're going to, again, they're going to do one of two things. They're either going to fight or they're going to fly. Most of the time they'll fly, but sometimes you just never know. So always make sure you've got a safe way out um, when you're dealing with big mammals like this. Um, flight shots, so just really quickly, tripods are helpful, but they can be a hindrance. Um, 
I always prefer to shoot handheld. It's betting for panning or moving with the birds. Um, use higher film speeds to achieve faster shutter speeds to freeze the motion. At minimum, you'll want at least one two thousandths of a second or higher and an aperture of F8 or higher, uh, which will freeze the motion and give you sharpness in the eyes and from wingtip to wingtip, as in the example of the image on the bottom of the sandwich turn, you can actually see what the exposure was. Um, if you have cameras that will do it, use your continuous autofocus and group, group autofocus settings. I know that Canon and Nikon call each of those something different. What they basically do is you've got one active sensor, that's the primary focusing sensor, and there's a group of sensors around it, which if as the bird or and or mammal moves, those alternate sensors around the primary sensor will pick it up. Uh, watch for indications of impending flight. will give you a tip as to when they're about to take off. This can be anything from wing stretches, and this may sound a little gross, but most birds will actually defecate before they take off. So if you see one do that, it's a good sign they're probably thinking about getting ready to take to the air. <clears throat> and it gives you a little bit of a warning. Um, definitely position so the wind is coming from behind you because birds like planes always tend to take off into the wind. So if you wanna, and they'll tend to land that way too. So position so the wind is coming from behind you and then you'll get them coming at you or at least coming across your field of view. Um, a few tips on purchasing equipment for wildlife photography. Don't break the bank. Um, spend money where is necessary. Buy quality lenses versus high-end cameras. Do not ignore the used market and match what equipment you're buying to what you intend to photograph. So if you're going out with an interest in photographing flowers, there's no point in buying telephoto lenses when you're gonna be much better off buying macro lenses and you can focus up closer with ways to kind of get started to learn how to do this great real ways to take field workshop there's numbers of photographers out there that are doing this that provide instruction joining a camera club is a really good idea um, learning the software these days with digital cameras is pretty much a must uh, there's a few links down here at the bottom that provide sources on um, you know, online training that you can do. Um, check a photographer of a magazine like Outdoor Photographer. They list tons of people that are doing bird, doing wildlife and bird photography workshops um, all around the country. And basically, just get out and do it and practice, practice, practice. That's really what it takes because you only learn this truly by doing it. And I think. That's the last slide, except for the one that's out of order, which is that one right there. And let's switch the view again. I don't know why that went into that view. There we go. Of course, now we're. Well, anyways, let me get to that slide real quick. There it is right there. So if anybody has any questions, uh, please feel free to contact me either with those phone numbers listed or through the website listed there. And then without further ado, I know it was a lot of information in a very short amount of time. So if you have any questions, please contact me and I'm gonna turn it over to David and Ben. Thanks, Nick. Um, you wanna uh, disconnect your, or unshare your screen? Sure. Yep, there we uh, go. Nick, thanks so much. Uh, just so everyone knows, we will, we will have a recording of this uh, available for anybody who wants it. Uh, that was a lot of information pretty quickly, especially on the technical end. So thanks again, Nick. And uh, as he said, please feel free to contact him directly. And now I'm going to turn it over. Well, let me introduce Ben and then uh, he can get started. So Ben, uh, surprising to me now, he's only been photographing wildlife for about eight years after retiring from a long career at L.L. Bean, where he is a director and senior uh, manager for uh, outdoor sporting goods. Uh, ben has a place on Richardson Lake that's been in his family since 1905. His great grandfather bought it. And Ben is now the president of Friends of Richardson. And you can often bump into him as he patrols uh, one of the Rangeley Lakes. 
<clears throat> in, in a variety of watercraft. Uh, and just so everyone knows, Ben will be publishing a book in March on the Rangeley, the Rangeley region. And uh, I've seen some of the proofs and such. It's going to be beautiful. So uh, keep an eye out for that. Uh, without it, further ado, uh, Ben. OK, can you hear me? Yeah. That's good. All right, so I'm going to cover. Thanks, Nick. That was great. And I learned a few things. Um, you'll see my camera settings have changed as I figure things out more and more. And I'm going to change a couple again now that I've listened to Nick. Um, but I'm going to cover on the move on the water, which is a little bit different um, in that you'll keep hearing me say, be ready, because versus sitting someplace waiting for things to happen, when you're on the move or on the water, things are going to happen that you don't know are coming, or it just, you have like sometimes two seconds, sometimes five seconds to, to grab that great shot. So you need to be ready. Um, but on the water, you got the lakes and shorelines. Their wildlife are always coming down to those. And you do have those clear views. As Nick uh, mentioned, in the woods, it's pretty tough. And what I like is you can approach quietly. You can really scout long distances with binoculars and maybe see a different color on shore and go, all right, there's something there. How do I work my way up to it? And then, as often happens with me, if I get skunked, I had a really good time out paddling on the water. So it's not a wasted day. And the one last little reminder is dry feet and bug protection will really make it much better on the water. Uh, the mingies come out early in the morning and late at night when the wildlife is out. And, you know, it's amazing the difference between having long sleeves, long pants, and a little bug dope on, how much more fun you're having than trying to take a shot while you're fighting the bugs. So um, those are a couple of little tips. Okay. What I use a lot, my if I have a choice, I'm going to go out my kayak because I can travel a further distance. Um, and I have the rudder, which can help position the kayak. So as you stop paddling, so you're trying to keep all your motion to a minimum. Uh, in a canoe, the canoe tends to turn the wrong way most of the time. Um, boats, the, the wind's going to catch them. But with a kayak, you can usually use the rudder to keep honing in on the subject. And, you know, they're not that tippy. And once you're in them, you're in pretty good shape. The, the time you're going to tip over is usually getting in and out. So I'm really careful that I get in the kayak. And then I put my gear in between my legs. Um, and I feel pretty safe. But as you can see, I've got two different uh, kits here. One that rubber bag has a smaller camera with a 18 to 200 lens for anything that gets up close. And then the other one is my standby, which is a 80 to 400 zoom. It's on a D800, which is 36 megapixels, which lets me crop and still get some close ups because 400, I'm at the limit usually of the reach of that lens. And uh, so I usually need to crop to get a really close up shot. Uh, but with the 36 megapixels, I can usually pull that off. But this is my usual kayak setup. And then if I'm in a boat, I have this big ammo box because it's bilge water that I'm worried about, or sometimes rain. I'm not usually worried about tipping over. And so I find this works great for me. I can keep a number of lenses in there because on the lakes, if there's no wildlife, you often have some great landscape shot opportunities. So you want to have both lenses with you. And then I find Pelican boxes are bomb proof and you're going to see those most often, but they are really noisy to open and kind of hard on the thumbs. So I'll use one if I'm in whitewater or something like that. But other than that, I, I tend to use this maybe less secure, but bigger and easier to open uh, ammo box. So be mindful, be ready um, is my mantra when I'm out on the move. And as you can see, it was one of my first wildlife shots. And as I say here, I had last night's landscape settings, which is one thirtieth of a second, which is not quite the one two thousandths Nick would recommend, an F-16. Uh, so I wasn't mindful or ready. I was close enough that it's still a fun shot, but it really wasn't what it could have been. So this is much better settings. So this is a mink that just swam the lake. And I thought he would be spooked because I was out on the lake trying to get a picture of him on the lake and he just would turn away from me every time. So you couldn't get the eyes, you couldn't get the head. And he didn't care one bit that he, if he had to swim across the lake back the way he came, he would have done it. So finally I just backed off and let him go to shore. 
where he just nonchalantly got up on a rock like I wasn't there and, and gave me this great opportunity. And you, you just never know with wildlife. Um, but as Nick mentioned, you have to back off uh, many, many times, and then they'll act more naturally and it'll be a much nicer pose, much nicer shot. And of course, they're much happier about it as well. So backing off, even though you're going to be a little further away as far as the close up is often the best thing you can do. One of the things I love about wildlife photography is I just get to see things uh, with a camera that I cannot see with the eye or even with binoculars because I've frozen the motion. And uh, this is a blue heron that I was just walking along the shoreline and noticed it through the reeds and was able to get an opening and uh, got this shot. And uh, as Nick mentioned that getting the back ground into a blur so the head uh, pops out really helps the impact of the photo. Doesn't always happen, but uh, it's great when you can get it. So that was one of the more fun shots I had early in my career. Um, and then moving along. This was just last fall. This is the Be Ready. So I was going down the Kennebago in a canoe and just exploring all the little backwaters, had my camera ready, and this um female jumped out of the sweat never saw it and it's just up and out and it was moving out pretty quickly um and you can see from the look the minute nick saw this picture he said that's not a happy moose so i said no so it knows it's moose season but because i had the camera all ready to go i had maybe three seconds to get this shot before it was off into the underbrush so um you know just if you're on the move it's going to happen fast and you really got to get your settings figured out and for what you think is going to happen and have it really handy um, or you're going to miss the shot. This is a much easier shot. It was kind of fun. Um, a smiling frog. So again, wandering the shoreline, you're going to see all sorts of stuff. Some of it's the big, big wildlife, but don't be afraid to focus on the little things um, because they're fun too. Here's a, for on the water, um, you're gonna have a really hard time if there's any wave action, getting a good focus because the, the camera loves to pick up the reflective waves and the light of the waves. And autofocus is one minute you're on the subject and the next minute a wave comes through and it pops off and, and you miss the shot. And I was taking a lot of shots and not getting very many in focus. Um, so on the next shot, I, uh, as Nick mentioned, uh, he likes F8. I went to F16. I was having so much trouble with the getting autofocus. So I was giving myself some, uh, a little bit more room. So the, the, the depth of field was much larger and I was able to nail this shot of the otters. Um, but I wasn't using back button focus, which I'll talk about in a minute then. I was still using focus that ran right off the shutter. And so every time you press the button on your shutter, it refocuses and Sometimes if you finally have attained focus on an animal, you want it to not change. And that's where back button focus can really help. And I'll talk to that in a second. Here's another example as Nick talked about uh, background and silvery water is kind of like gray sky um, and you get a lot of it. So you should, when you go out, try to figure out where there's good dark reflections in the water you know, pick the side of the lake where there might be interesting reflections or get where there's some good background because if you have a lot of silver water, your picture just isn't gonna pop the way you wanted it to. And in this case, um, because there's so much silver water and it's just a long string, I actually like the lower picture better where I just focused on, you know, mama and the two, the two chicks on her back. Your eye goes to it easier and it just has a little more impact. So when you, Taking photos, sometimes less is more. Actually, most of the time, less is more. Um, and this is a case. And you never know what's gonna show up. Again, you need to be ready. Um, this is yellow legs, which we don't see a lot of, but I think it was in the fall migrating through. And I saw it working some pools off the side of uh, the McGalloway and just, as Nick said, sat down and, and watched it go to work. And next thing it, popped up with this fish and made a, a great fun photo. 
Um, I could have been a little faster on film speed and F8 probably would have been better because I had plenty of light. As you can see, I'm only at ISO 400. So, and I can go up to 2000 with that camera and still have a great shot. So um, one thing I'm tending to do is up both my film speed and my F, my aperture a little bit to get a little bit better focus. And that was quite a meal for this yellow legs. Yeah, uh, you could see quite the lump in his throat when he swallowed that, that shiner. Be mindful, be ready. Um, I saw the flash of orange on the shoreline as I was kayaking along Richardson Lake. Knew there was a deer around the point. Um, so then moved my kayak, which you'll wanna do in closer to shore to use the point to help cut me off. And also if you can get into shore, into the shade, that'll help you. Um, and the wind happened to be behind me and I had good light. So finally I positioned my kayak where I could get around, the wind would push me around the point and I just went totally motionless, but use the kayak rudder to keep me pointing where I wanted to go and just let the kayak drift around the point. And the buck's looking at me, but I'm not making any movement. He's just seeing the drift of the kayak, trying to figure out what it is. And I was able to, to get this shot. As I say at the bottom of the slide, I was just learning and my settings weren't where they really needed to be, but I still was able to get the shot. But it had been a better shot at probably uh, one five hundredth of a second, maybe F8. Again, it's not totally tack sharp, but it's pretty close. Um, but that's what your goal is. If you can get a tack sharp photo of wildlife um, and it's not easy to do, that's what you're aiming for. And 19 seconds later, this is what I got to see. He was gone. And that was the end of that. And you'll see a lot of that. And, and for the slideshow, a photo of a tail is all right, but most of the time that's not what you want. So you really need to have that camera ready to go, your settings set and uh, handy uh, to get it up and get the shot. There's a triad of exposure, um, and we mentioned it a little bit, but you've got your shutter speed, you've got your aperture, and you've got your ISO, the film speed. I find the ISO is the least critical of those three. As you can see, I'm at ISO 2000, which is pretty high, yet it's a fine photo. Um, but with wildlife, you don't have time to set all those. So going full manual on all three of those settings you're just gonna miss a lot of shots. So you need to have something automated because the camera can think faster than you. Um, I like to use manual where I set the film speed, the shutter speed and the aperture and I go on auto ISO and that'll fill in and make up for any changes in the light. If I'm in a tricky situation like trying to get a bald eagle with a white head, I may use what's called exposure compensation which will change the auto ISO so it'll be a little bit darker than what it would normally go for. So I don't blow out the, the white on the eagle's head or say on a loon. But I like to use that. But if you've got a simpler camera, camera and you're not ready for that, I would go with shutter priority on your camera and set the shutter speed to what you think you need for the situation because it's really getting that sharpness, which is really between your shutter speed and how good your autofocus got on the subject is gonna result in what level of sharpness you get. And that's really what you wanna get. So use one of those two and I think you're, you're gonna be in pretty good shape for most wildlife situations. Okay, so loons present, and loons are great. We have a lot of them and they're reasonably cooperative. And as Nick and I were discussing, all the every loon is different some are comfortable getting really close to you some are pretty spooky and you just have to paddle around until you find one that's uh, a little more comfortable with with we humans and you're probably going to get some good shots but they do present a dynamic range challenge where you've got this bright white and then this jet black and with loons you're trying you're always trying to get an animal's head in its eye so you don't want to underexpose that head so you lose the detail and you don't get to see a little bit of the shine in the head. But you might blow out a little bit of the white 
right here on the chest. It depends on what light you have, but if you have to make a choice, make sure you nail the exposure on the balloon's eye and its head, and you might give it up a little bit on the white. With some of the newer cameras, they have a bigger dynamic range. Um, so you might not run into the same problem we, we all have where most even good cameras had a, struggled with the dynamic range of that jet black and that bright white. But some of the newer cameras can, can get both without blowing them out. So if you can afford one, get one. Here's another example of a loon with a chick. And what I like about the photo is they're calm. This, this loon was comfortable with me with a chick. I think maybe, and this is probably me making this up, but it knew with me around, the eagles weren't going to harass it. Um, so she was fine with me staying pretty close and I was able to get some great photos. And here's where I have some nice water and a little bit of context with the background, um, but it's not really taking away from the photo. And this is cropping. So with the D800, um, with a really sharp uh, photo, I was able to crop in pretty tight on this and get a close up. And, you know, as Nick said, you want a good lens, good glass, sharp lens. Uh, most processes are pretty good right now, but definitely lenses will vary on how sharp they'll get. And then you really have to work the autofocus. Um, and back button focus, you can look it up online, but basically instead of using the shutter button to get autofocus working, there's a button on the back of your camera you can use and you disconnect the autofocus from the shutter button. And so you have to manually hit that button in the back for the focus. But once you get it, you can let that button off and it'll maintain that, that focal length um, on the subject. So any waves coming through or grass getting in the way or something else is not gonna change the focus on you when you didn't want it to. And yet when you have a bird in flight or something getting in the way, you just hold that button down and it'll go on continuous autofocus and adjust um, to whatever's going on. So I have found I have get a lot more keepers since I've moved to back button focus. Um, if there is a learning curve. You're going to forget to hit it when you're first trying to use it. And you're going to miss some shots until you get into the habit of using that autofocus. And then you just keep working the focus because sometimes autofocus isn't 100% and it may be a little off. So as Nick said, take a lot of shots, keep working the focus, and you can use it if you adjust the diopter on your camera so that it's your eye is seeing what's really sharp. Keep looking for that. And then when you get it, stay with that focus and, and you're gonna get some nice sharp shots. So this, um, this was late in the season and I would not normally go near a loon's nest, a floating noon, loon's nest um, during the nesting season. They were, should have been all off the nest. Uh, this loon was not, and it turned out it, that egg never hatched when I talked to the biologist, but talk about a look that will make you back up. I back paddled quite quickly, um, but I did take a shot while I was there. Um, but yeah, this is what, they look like when they're uh, trying to stay low and, and avoid you. This is an abandoned nest. Uh, again, paddling around, you're gonna see all sorts of things. And again, this one was, a, I knew it was abandoned because I'd seen the loons in the area, um, watched the area and hadn't seen loons from a distance in that area quite a while, in quite a while. And also this, they put the nest right at the bottom of a trail that comes into the lake that gets used fairly often. I, when I first started, I said, this is not gonna be a good spot. They're gonna get busted out of there. And here I use lands landscape settings, uh, trying to get the, the whole focus of both the nest, the egg, and then the background. And here's where back button focus really helped because it would be really easy for your focal point to just jump to any one of these shiny spots on the on the film and uh, and miss the main event. And I'm just trying to track it. And you can also, with back button focus, you can better frame your photo in that once you get the focal length you want, 
you can move the camera around and make sure you're putting enough room in front of the subject um, so that the picture looks natural. You don't want to, if they're moving uh, to the right, you want to have a little extra to the right if you can. And here, you know, you might, if you're shooting a loon like this straight on, it's going to be a lot of white in there and you might go to like a minus half stop exposure compensation so you don't blow out the chest. And yet you just have to mess around because every light is different and sometimes you can get it all and other times you're really going to have to compensate with just how bright those white feathers are. And this is my holy grail. Um, if you ever see a guy sitting in a boat somewhere with a cup of tea early in the morning waiting for something to fly by, it's probably me hoping uh, the loons will come around. Um, this one's getting closer, uh, but I can do better. And, uh, you know, as, as uh, Nick mentioned, I'm upping my uh, shutter speed, hope get a little bit crisp, crisper. And I'd love to have a longer lens for this because they don't usually come that close. I'm at, you know, 400 millimeters. It would be great to have 600 millimeters with a 1.4 teleconverter. So I get a, a longer reach. And as Nick suggested, I will be looking at the used market for that. 600 millimeter lens because I think a new one is $12,000 or something in that range. Um, and that's a lot of money for an amateur photographer. This Osprey was actually downed by an eagle, two eagles. And uh, we saw it out on the lake and he got up once and the eagles put him back in the drink again. And then he was just struggling out in the lake. Um, I don't know whether it was feathers got too wet or he was exhausted because he had been chased all around the lake by the eagle. Um, so finally we decided we had a debate on should we let nature take its course or should we try to rescue and we, we decided we were going to rescue. Um, so this is from my boat out in the middle of the lake. I've got the silver water but I'm getting enough definition and with some post-processing I was able to uh, to get them to pop out a little bit. But this is really to show you what, you know, if you want a little motion, if you can get like the main body still, but the wings moving, it makes a fun photo and gives a little bit of a sense of motion, which is always great for a realistic photo. So you don't always have to get everything tack sharp. You want the eye and the head tack sharp for sure, if you can get it. But other moving parts uh, sometimes are not so bad. Um, I think he's a little bit embarrassed sitting on the bow of my boat. I netted him. I was a lacrosse player. I had the move down to scoop him up and keep him in the net. And you can look at that bottom right slide and see uh, what the business end of an Osprey looks like. And, and you don't, that net was a long handled net and uh, I was glad it was. I wasn't gonna get anywhere near this guy. As Nick said, practice really helps and you know, find some cooperative birds, low stress birds, and seagulls are a great example. If you wanna work on your birds in flight, go out, catch some chubs, go out in a boat, throw them out around your boat, the seagulls will come, and then just keep practicing with either your regular focus, back button focus, try different settings, try tracking it, you know, see what your, see what the difference is in frame rates if you're on your continuous shooting you can see how much movement actually happens between even at at five frames per second is uh you don't capture everything that you still need to time your shots um, but i found seagulls and, I, and you can see if you're blowing out the white or not and you get some black so a lot to be learned from a seagull and they're 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 really cooperative so give that a try this isn't out on the water but Shots I got this spring and again, be mindful, be ready. And this is where back button focus really saved the day because there's a lot of grass between me and, and these uh, coyote pups and autofocus wanted to get on it every time I tried. And I just used back button focus to hold a little high like up on the ears. And then I could lower the camera to frame the shot the way I wanted it. I don't have good enough eyesight to manually focus, so I have to rely on the camera. But back button focus saved the day for me with these coyote pups. And then you can always learn from your mistakes. Um, this was oh, a couple of years ago, three years ago, and there was a, a wounded goose. I don't know whether it had 
cancer or a broken wing or something, but it was swimming around the lake at about a 25 degree list, obviously really sick and not gonna make it. And this eagle noticed it as well. So he's tracking the loon, I mean the, the goose along the shore and I'm out in my kayak hoping to get the action. And I followed both the, the goose and the eagle around, the eagle would reposition and he just wouldn't take the goose because eagles are like people. They think you think the way they do. And he's thinking, if I take this goose, that guy in the kayak's gonna come steal it from me. So as Nick's mentioned, I had to back off um, to a comfortable distance for the eagle before he, he made his, his attack on the goose. And I was quite a ways away, further than I wanted to be, but I didn't have uh, the rest of the day to hope that he would, would do that. And he did not like me being that close. So the shot happened. And what could have been the shot of a lifetime wasn't. And it was both poor focused and too slow a shutter speed. And uh, part of that was, this was all in the shade. And so I was having a really hard time with autofocus. I actually turned it off after I got a sharp focus because it just was bouncing all over the place. And I was pretty high on my ISO because it was dark. So I had a, I'd slowed the shutter speed down and then all the action happened right in this little ray of light. Um, it was quite aggravating. Um, and as you can see from the shot on the right, what the conditions were, it's dark everywhere except for this little ray of light. I was not ready for that. And, uh, you know, didn't get this shot. I'm not going to see a shot like that again. Um, so I learned. I said, I need to I need to work on this. And as Nick said, practice, practice. And went to the internet, studied a little bit on how to deal with situations like this and, and uh, changed my settings. Okay, this is this spring. And there was an eagle's nest uh, on Richardson this year, an active eagle's nest. And um, some fishermen that troll a lot had told me about it. So I'd run down in the morning to, to check it out. And Mama and Papa Eagle were both there in two eaglets. And the male eagle, who was small, it took off. And uh, all of a sudden, I saw him coming back. And so I've got the, the lens on this eagle and trying to focus in on it. I'm on continuous shot. But I knew from my experience with the, uh, that, that other eagle shot that I need to be right on the, the action scene and get that figured out or it's not going to happen. And plus the other thing, you do not want to fill your buffer at the wrong time. Uh, you take too many in-flight shots um, beforehand and all of a sudden your camera's just going to stop and not take another photo when you want it to because the buffer is processing all that. So you do need to be mindful of that. So that, I did get the shot. I actually quit trying to shoot at the flying eagle and focused on uh, the female eagle, got the focus nailed with back button focus, backed off on focusing because I needed to be, I needed the camera to be shooting as fast as it would and not refocusing. and was able to get this shot, um, which made me feel a lot better about the one I missed with the eagle and the goose. And I did have this at a minus, one stop exposure compensation because it was pretty bright light and I didn't want to blow out the white on the eagle's head and on the tail. Uh, made the chicks a little darker, but um, I was able to bring that back uh, using some uh, shadow adjustments in Lightroom. So this is uh, again a long ways off, um, but I needed to get the angle on this nest and by using back button focus to really nail, you know, the preci precise focus on the eagle, I was able to, uh, I'm able to crop down and get some pretty good close-ups, even though I'm probably whew, at least 250 feet away from these eagles with a 400 millimeter lens. Meanwhile, right down below, these mergansers, totally oblivious to the eagles in the nest up above, came swimming down the shore and uh, hopped up on this rock. So I was able to get this, I moved in close, was able to get this shot. Um, and I think I actually saved some lives because these eagles would have been on top of those chicks 
in a second, but I was right in there and, and they, they stayed up in the nest. But I was able to get this great shot. And Magansas are another cooperative bird. If you're, if you're trying to practice, Magansas will usually let you get pretty close. Uh, so you can have a lot of fun finding them and just practicing on focus and different camera settings and angles and, and uh, have a good time with them. As Nick and I also were discussing, you know, what's our, what's our keeper rate? And uh, you're not gonna bat a thousand. So these pictures above, I noticed this eagle down on the shore at Alderbrook. This is just a crop. The second picture in is just a crop of that first picture. And you can see I've got the focus pretty sharp. And the minute he took off, I'm on continuous shooting, continuous focus. And it's pretty good, but it's a little fuzzy. It's not as sharp as it was right there. And it's just a function of the autofocus system. And, you know, probably I needed to be at, I think I was F 5.6 and this maybe F8 would have done it for me. But as we both discussed 300, if you get a third of your shots or even 25% of your shots that are keepers, that should be keepers, uh, you're doing pretty good because there's always something that's gonna come up. Uh, that'll prevent getting that perfect shot you had in your mind's eye. Again, trying to nail the focus is key and uh, keep practicing that. So these eagles, um, I was able to capture the, they were both tagged, both parent eagles were tagged. And I was able to read the tags and through Kyle Murphy at uh, Brookfield, who's their biologist, he contacted um, Bill Hansen, the, the uh, biologist in this picture, who actually was the one who banded those eagles. He works for BRI, Biodiversity Institute. And um, I got the history of the eagles and they were excited because they had never had a nesting pair where they were both banded. Uh, he came up and he actually banded both eaglets, um, which was fun. And then one of them jumped out of the nest and I let him know about that. He came back up and put it back in the nest and it stayed there for three days. Then it jumped out again. And then eventually both of them jumped out. Um, but by that time they were able to hop up into branches if they needed to, they weren't flying yet. And the parents were feeding them on shore. They're, they're gone now. I think they, they learned how to fly and I think they made it. But what a lot of fun um, being able to help the biologists with my photos, uh, but also get the history of where the parents came from and I'm looking forward to see hearing about where these eaglets go off in the future. So that's one of the fun things of wildlife photography is with a little bit of network you can sometimes uh, get the whole story which is fun. As Nick said um, sometimes sitting works and one thing I've used because again I only have that 400 millimeters is if you do get a bird that's in a habit I'll put my camera out on a tripod with the remote release and just sit back because they're gonna, you know, if it's out in the open, they're gonna see me and not go back to that perch. And uh, both these bird photos, uh, my camera is maybe 40 feet away or less, um, focused on the perch and they came back and with the remote release, I was able to get these shots. Now this beaver kit, I was out skiing and I could hear all this noise in the beaver dam and you could hear the beavers were active down there and there was a hole open to the outside. So just on a bit of a lark, I popped the, it was on my first camera that had a flash built into it. And so I popped the flash and put the remote on it and stuck it down in the hole. And when I heard the noise getting close, I, I hit the shutter and I got this shot. Um, which was a lot of fun because I had no idea what was making the noise down there. So, you know, a remote on your camera for wildlife, you can have a lot of fun with that. And lastly, be mindful, be ready. Um, this, I was sitting at my kitchen table and uh, this bull moose walks right by the window and I had my camera ready because I'd seen a bull moose in the yard the week before a different one and was able to snap this shot as it uh, went by with my smaller lens, and then I popped the bigger lens on and uh, went out, followed where it went in the woods and uh, was able to run around a road 
as it went into the woods, waiting to see if it would come out, and it came out where I thought it would. And in this case, the moose got within my uh, fight or flight distance. I put my hand up and said, stop right there. You're close enough. And uh, he did. He's looking at me going, what is going on? And he just turned around and went the other way. But he was within 75 feet, and I figured I could maybe get into the really thick brush I had for cover um, 10 feet away before he covered the 75 feet. But I wasn't going to let him get any closer than that. Um, so I got that shot. And um, so get out in the field, enjoy the moment, keep at it, and have fun. You're going to miss more than you get. Did I mention be ready? Be ready. This bear showed up. I was eating lunch on the porch, had the camera next to me, and it's the only bear I've seen in 60 years at the camp. So uh, get out there and have a great time. Thanks. Thanks, Ben. Uh, and uh, thank you, Nick. Uh, so we're, we're out of time, but please feel free to contact Ben. Ben, you want to just say what your e uh, email address is? Yeah, it's um, Pearson Ben, P E A R S O N B E N at Comcast.net. Sorry for going over. No, you're um, perfect. I'm willing to stay on for questions. I'm, I'm willing to take questions too. Okay, good. Well, then, uh, if you have a question, please type it into your uh, chat box down there. And while you think of a few questions, uh, maybe uh, Ben and, and uh, Nick just talk for a minute about uh, one of the highlights of your photography career in the field. I'm sorry, was that question addressed to me or Ben? Uh, both. But go ahead, Nick. Oh, one of the highlights. Wow. I think, well, I got to get an image to show you that, that will explain this. Okay. I apologize if everybody can't see this, but this image right here is, well, I don't know. Can Hold it up the see? camera. Yeah, there you go. It's that image right there. And that's not cropped. That's the actual picture taken in Kenya oh. probably 18 years ago. Hmm. But I'll never forget this moment for two reasons. A, because when a lion looks at you, you know you've been looked at. And this one was looking right straight at me about 30 feet away. Thankfully, I was in a vehicle. <laughs> so he couldn't get at me. Um, but this, in this particular moment, he was walking along with his brother. They're both about five years old, making that whoosh sound that lions make. And you could feel the sound wave from it go right through your body. <laughs> and I was so stunned. I forgot to take pictures. The guy had to reach up and <laughs> nudge me with his elbow and say, hey, snap out of it <laughs> that's probably my most memorable moment out that's of all great. that that's the one that sticks in my head the most yeah yeah that's great thanks nick ben, ben, uh, four. <laughs> uh, these <laughs> eagles have been my my highlight the eagles that i was showing this this yeah. spring with the uh with the interaction with the biologists to hear where they came from and and hopefully see where they're going to go in the future that's just been a lot of fun yeah. and uh finding out it was pretty funny. I was, there was, one was missing. And then all of a sudden it showed up again. And I'm like, what in heck? And uh, I had no idea that Bill Hansen had gone up and put it back in the nest. And I thought I was going crazy. <laughs> <laughs> and, he, and he said, I was going to accuse you of drinking. And then he let me know that uh, he'd actually put it back in the nest. So it's been a lot of fun. And, uh, you know, it's, you just never know what's going to come around the corner. But this has been a, a big highlight to eight. Hey, and get a, a great photo that makes up for my missed goose shot too. Cause that was, that was on my mind for a while going, that was quite the, the situation that I didn't quite nail it on. So yeah, that's been fun. Great. Great, well, I don't, uh, here's one, uh, uh, just a uh, thank you, uh, numerous thank yous. So uh, I wanna thank you again, Ben and Nick, and uh, look, look out for Ben's book uh, in March sometime. Please come up to the region if you're not already here. And thank you all of you both for being on this call and for caring about conservation and wildlife in Maine's Western Mountains. So thank you all. And uh, we will have a recording available uh, of the entire uh, webinar, except for the first three minutes, which I forgot to record, sorry. Uh, so take care everyone, thank you very much. <laughs>